We're in session 21 of the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to take a short little detour. You'll see why in a minute. We're going to actually take a look at a few chapters from the Gospel of John. And um, we've been, we're obviously pursuing the final week of uh, Jesus' ministry. And in Matthew, that's uh, chapters 26, 27, 28, forthcoming. We've been looking at the parallel passages in both Mark and Luke as we've been doing this. But when we get to, the, to, to John, it's so important, I wanted to set a session aside. As we budgeted this, we realized we had a, a, a session we could commit to this. So we're going to explore, having just been, you see, in the upper room. We've just been there with the, the, the Lord's Supper and, and uh, the, the washing of the feet and so forth. But uh, we left till, for this session to explore John. Now, you may recall when we were looking at Matthew in the very beginning, there are four major discourses in the New Testament. Sermon on the Mount, the Mystery Parables Discourse, and the Olivet Discourse as it's called, and the Upper Room Farewell Address that we're going to look at tonight. Three of these, obviously, are in the Gospel of Matthew, and we reviewed that as we went. And I felt that by just budgeting ourselves a session here to pick up this fourth discourse, I think it'll give us a much more complete perspective of this very, very critical period of time. In fact, in John's gospel, he devotes half of the chapters to this final week of Christ's ministry. So it's obviously very, very critical. So, so we're going to, this session, take a look at the upper room farewell address and the new relationships that he announces as a result of his death, resurrection, and ascension, and then his continuing intercession on our behalf. So We'll start with John 13, the Upper Room Discourse. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the Passover service that we talked about last time is now complete. Not quite complete. There's part of it that isn't complete yet. Remember, there's four cups, and it's the third cup that he uses to institute what we call the Lord's Supper, and indicating that he will not touch the fruit of the vine until we're all together with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So um, it's interesting. So, But anyway, the supper having for practical purposes being ended, the devil now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. And uh, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things uh, into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God. Uh, he riseth from supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Obviously, this rather startled everyone. And uh, his outer garment, um, he's still wearing his tunic, but... Uh, the normal costume for a servant is the way he's now attired. And um, see, a slave of Jewish birth could not be forced to wash feet, by the way. It's an interesting little thing you get out of the Torah. And uh, so, but in any case, he's making a demonstration here. He cometh to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. <laughs> Don't you love Peter? He always knows better, doesn't he? Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. Okay. Peter's basic philosophy is, if a little bit's good, a whole lot's a lot better. See, so, so. And Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, ye are not all clean. So it's clear that Judas is still apparently among them in this, in this uh, 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 event here. All the events, all the accounts are not exactly chronologically identical, as you can probably tell. So after he had washed their feet, had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? In other words, do you understand this, guys? They're obviously startled that the man himself is put himself in the role of a servant washing their feet. And uh, 
It says, ye call me master and Lord, and ye see well, for so, so I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. And he's obviously speaking idiomatically. That was an appropriate procedure where they wore sandals and so forth. That's, most of us are not concerned about having your feet washed when you come here for whatever in terms of normal routine. It's, it's, he's using it here idiomatically to make a point. He's essentially giving them their org chart. And the org chart's upside down. The boss is the servant of all. That's really what he's trying to say. This is an exact opposition to the concept of the Nicolaitans that we talked about when we were studying Revelation 2 and 3. In any case, for I've given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you. Now, there's a handful of these verily, verilies. When Jesus wanted to emphasize something, he'd say, I say unto you thus and so. If he wanted to really underline, he'd say, verily, I say unto you thus and so. But if he really wanted to underline it, he'd say, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, and so on. The servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. So this is the foot washing. It's an example of humility. It's also a rebuke to pride. Boy, how pride can, can create contention and strife. Now, this is a rebuke to pride. It's also a picture of our daily cleansing. We're going to see references to that before we're through. It was also, in effect, a warning to Judas Iscariot. And it's a picture of his own humiliation that's forthcoming. These are just a couple of things. And it's also a reminder of his union and communion with the believer. We're going to see much of that in the, this evening as we go through this uh, unusual discourse, th chapters 13 through 17, that we're going to explore tonight. Continuing, if ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the Scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it has come to pass, that ye may believe that I am he. Now this, of course, was echoed in history by Ahithophel, who, who, uh, be, you know, who betrayed David. Absalom was leading a rebellion, and Ahithophel, this elderly man, left David to counsel um, Absalom. And uh, that's exactly what Psalm 49 deals with, the one in whom I trusted and so forth. And uh, so, now he, Jesus had warned them about this a year earlier, back in John 6, incidentally. But uh, lifted up his feet against me. That's the idiom that comes from the kick of a mule or a horse, is really where it has its origin. They're, they're all reclining by, around about a 12-inch high table. John is to his right, Judas to his left. And uh, John five times is called the one whom Jesus loved, and he's, a, he's a, where he can lean on Jesus' breast. But uh, Judas is on the left. And it's interesting that leftness is all through classic art now because of that. To be gauche in French or sinister. Those are, means, those are words meaning left, but they've come to be idiomatic of, of sinister. If you look at art, the, the hand of God is always a right hand, you know, in the Rodin especially. And ma many people miss the prayer. You know, Rodin is a very famous sculpture, which has the two hands. And, and people don't notice they're both right hands. See, it's not one person praying, it's two people fellowshipping. But it's always a right hand, interestingly enough. Anyway, that's, that's been picked up in classical art. Anyway, Jesus continues, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me. And he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Comes up and makes it very, very clear. And uh, so, you know, it's kind of interesting as we reflect on this whole foot washing thing. The room obviously had been supplied with uh, water and a towel. It's interesting that no one had used it until Jesus picked it up and played that role. I, I, I think that's kind of interesting. Um, but uh, anyway, moving on. The disciples looked at one another, doubting of whom he spake. They're shook up that someone's going to betray him. And as I pointed out before, what Jesus is really doing, he is forcing the hand here. They had not planned to betray him that night, not during a feast day. That was the, that was the strategy from in, uh, in, uh, earlier in Matthew, you may recall. 
But Jesus is now announcing it, so that's in effect putting Judas on the spot. He either has to fish or cut bait, as we would say. And uh, so Jesus, the point I want to keep in front of us all the way through is that Jesus is controlling every step. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That's a phrase that John always uses of himself here. Speaks of himself in the third person, but in a way that you know who it is. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spoke. Then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. So Jesus is clearly identifying, at least to the people right next to him there, who the identity of the betrayer is, or is going to be. And, uh, and after the sop, Satan entered into him. I think that's a very interesting, we all know that he entered Judas, but I was very curious as to when it occurs. Why? Because he's later, in Matthew 27, he's going to confront the Pharisees, he's going to try to give the money back. And, and when he throws it on the temple floor, he's going to say, I have betrayed innocent blood. I'm always int intrigued that that declaration of Christ's innocence comes from the lips of Satan, in effect. I think that's interesting. I don't think he intended it that way, but anyway. After the sop, Satan entered into him, and then said Jesus unto him, that thou, that, that thou doest, do quickly. Now, so obviously Judas had to split and make arrangements. They were not ready for this. He had to go find his backers. They had a lot they had to do. They had to arrange not only a guard for the arrest, they had to start making arrangements to see Pilate in the morning. You couldn't just do that automatically. And they had to make their political arrangements to have an appointment with Pilate the next morning. So there's all kinds of things. That's why it goes on some time when we get to Gethsemane, some time goes by as they get ready for all this. And anyway, no man at the table knew for what intent he spake thus unto him. For some of them thought because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things which we have need for against the feast, or that he should have given something to the poor. They all assume he might be on a business errand because he was the treasurer of the group. And uh, so the, the group in general didn't really understand all this until later, reflecting back. He then, having received the sop, that's Judas, immediately went out, and it was night. And for Judas, it's still night, even now. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. And if God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. We're going to hear more about this as we go here. The greatest event in the universe is about to unfold. It's going to reverse the results of the conduct of the first man. Through death destroyed him who had the power of death, the devil, that's what's going to be accomplished this night before it's over. Purchased for himself the entire elect of God. Every one of us throughout history that are saved were purchased by him in the next 24 hours, in effect. And one of the questions we need to ponder is what held him to that cross? He was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the hill on which it stood. He was the creator of the universe, incarnate. And at any time, he could have said, enough, I'm out of here. It wasn't the nails that held him to that cross. It was his strength of his love for you and me. And he, now there is now a glorified man. As we meet here tonight, the astonishing thing is that there is a man, a kinsman of Adam, strangely, on the throne of David. Excuse me, not on the throne of David. On the throne of the ruler of the universe, God the Father. He has yet to take the throne of David. That's yet forthcoming. That was promised to Mary by Gabriel in Luke 1, but is yet to happen. He continues, little children, yet a little while I'm with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Little children, the word is technia. It's a diminutive techna, and uh, it's the only occurrence of that word in the Gospel of John, but it's used frequently in his epistles. And uh, 
Now, it says, a new commandment I give unto you. Many people say, gee, isn't this the same thing as Leviticus 19.18, the golden rule? No, it's something far deeper than that. And to really understand that, you have to read 1 Corinthians 13. It's the ultimate amplification of that, which I assume is familiar to you. If not, check it out. Put it in your notes. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, whither I go, thou canst not follow me now. But thou shalt follow me afterwards. And obviously Peter had no idea what he was talking about. And um, this is Peter, you know, this is the guy that um, was at the transfiguration. This is the guy that was willing to step out and try walking on water there on the lake, if you recall, and so forth. So he's a gutsy guy. But uh, whither I go now, thou canst not follow me, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. One of the lessons we need to ponder, we're going to see unfold here with Peter's famous um, denial of Christ, is to realize that Peter failed in his strongest suit. Peter's primary strength was his courage, and yet that's where he folded. We need to be careful about that. When we stumble, it isn't necessarily our weakest suit. It may be what we think is our strongest suit. Very sober lesson. We must have no confidence in the flesh. That's the real lesson here. And when Peter says to him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Do you think he was sincere? Think he was really willing to do that? At that time, at that moment, of course. Jesus answers him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto you, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. And that's going to unfold before us in each of the accounts. Let's go on to John 14. And this, of the chapters, this one's often overlooked because what he's really talking about is what Paul would call the harpazo, the snatching out. Jesus, con <clears throat> Jesus continues, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If we're not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That's very, very straightforward. And yet it's often overlooked in terms of its real implications. We're going to see four questions unfold before us in this discourse. That's, Lord, where are you going? That's one of the questions he's going to deal with. Because Jesus is soon going to be invisible to them. Yet he wants them not to be sad, but to rejoice. He wants to give them at least some limited understanding to what's afoot. And you can check that out. First Peter deals with that in First Peter 1, 8 and so on. Now, Jesus said, if my father's house were many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. That's why he went, to prepare a place for us. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I want you to notice it's you, 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 all through here. Notice his focus. And he's not talking just to those 12. He's talking to us here this evening, if you're in Christ. The blessed hope. Many mansions. He's preparing a place for us. He is going to return for us. That's different than the second coming of Christ in which he comes to judge, which he comes to set up a throne, a political uh, government, etc. We will be where he is, and incidentally, forever. That's why we call it the blessed hope. He will return for us. That's the harpazo in the, in the, in the Greek, the, the forcible snatching out. The phrase come again is used four times. It's used the rapture, the spiritual presence in, chapter, in verse 18. The indwelling of the believer, the Holy Spirit is going to deal with that, and the post-resurrection ministry, that he's going to deal with all of these things in this chapter. Now, he also, the blessed hope involves a brand new thing. When you first study your Bible, the first astonishing event you try to grasp is the fact that the creator of the universe became a man, took on the restrictions of mass, energy, gravity, whatever, and became a man and dwelt among us. That's mind-blowing. But then as we begin to mature further and understand the gap that exists between a holy 
perfect God and sinful man, as we begin to get a glimpse or an understanding of what that gap involves, an even more astonishing thing in many respects is that there, it, there sits right now today a man on the throne room of the universe. Astonishing. The redemption of the purchased possession in heaven by better sacrifices, as Hebrew 9 places it. All this was not a surprise. It was planned on before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1.14. And it's all going to be purchased by the events that are about to transpire in the next 24-hour period. We're, going, we're obviously in the evening, finishing a dinner. We're on our way, presumably, to Gethsemane here. There's going to be trials go on through the night. There'll be the events with Pilate in the morning. But by that afternoon, he'll be on a cross. And by nightfall, he'll be in a grave. And that's purchasing more than we have any capacity to imagine. We need to understand, as we use some of these idioms, the Jewish wedding. There's, it starts with the betrothal, the ketubah, where the payment of the purchase price for the bride is consummated. She is then set apart sanctified is the term, uh, for the bridegroom. And this is a, a binding relationship. It would take a divorce to break this. This was the relationship between Joseph and Mary when he found out that she was uh, uh, with child. It was, uh, it was a difficult situation. The bridegroom then, after the ketubah, departs to the father's house Typically, he would build an addition to that house for his family, but he would depart for some indeterminate period of time to prepare a room addition. The bride, in the meantime, in his absence, would prepare for his imminent return, not knowing when he's going to re return, but to expect him at any moment. That was the game they played. And then there's a surprise regathering or gathering of them, and the wedding is consummated. Hoopa. And then there was a seven-day marriage supper. That was the classical ancient pattern. And these, many of the idioms in the Bible assume that background. And uh, so, and you can find all kinds of references. They'll be in your notes if you want to make a, you, you, you track these things down as a study. Well, the covenant was established with us in 1 Corinthians 11. The purchase price was, of course, uh, Christ's purchase of us in 1 Corinthians 6. The bride is to be set apart. That's, that describes our situation today. Should be reminded of the covenant. These all in 1 Corinthians 11 and so forth. The bridegroom has indeed left currently for his father's house. And uh, he will have an escort to accompany him, accompany him on his return to gather his bride. That's what, first, that's what Paul deals with in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Let's move on though. Jesus and whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Then Thomas spoke up. He was from Missouri, of course. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And then we have verse 6, one of the most famous verses in the Bible. A real mouthful here. He said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So this leads to the second of our major questions. How can we know the way? And that's what Jesus is responding to right here. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That says it all. That's one of these um, very, very inclusive statements. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Wow. The way. The same word as highway, the road, if you will. The highway to heaven, literally, by the way. It shows up seven times, not only here in John, but all through the book of Acts. The way. Being a Christian is what we speak. In those days, they said they knew the way. They spoke of the way as the thing that they were following, following Christ. And uh, this whole phrase speaks of the exclusiveness of Christ. He's the, he, not only is he the way, he's the only way. Acts 4.12 makes that... Very, very crisp and clear. Also in Gethsemane, three times he's going to pray when we get there shortly. He's going to pray three times. If there be any other way, let's take it, Father. If there's any other way to get to heaven than through Christ, then his prayer was not answered in Gethsemane because he asked to be off the hook. 
if there was any other way. By the way, it's interesting, the word zodiac, or the constellations of the heavens, comes from the Sanskrit word sodi, which means the way. And the Maseroth in the Hebrew, from the, lion, from the virgin birth all the way to the lion of the tribe of Judah, uh, these 12 constellations speak of the plan of God. So I encourage you, Psalm 19 opens that door, and you can, you can uh, study that. If you haven't looked at that, I encourage you to dig into it. I am the way and the truth and the life. The truth. The spirit of truth had yet not been given. It's going to be given, and John's going to talk more about that when you get to chapter 16. In fact, Pilate puts his finger on the core issue, even though he asks the question sort of rhetorically and as a, as a cynical gesture, what is truth? And we'll encounter that in effect tomorrow morning when we get through the Gethsemane part of it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the best analogy I can think of here is the prodigal son when he is restored. He was dead, but now is alive again, is the expression there in Luke 15 and elsewhere. Adam, before sin, enjoyed communion with his maker. He knew him, and he possessed spiritual life. But in the day that thou eatest, he would surely die. Adam had then, from that point on, a threefold need for reconciliation, for illumination, and for regeneration. And that's what's being produced here by God himself, taking, stepping into Adam's shoes, in effect. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Imagine Philip felt a little embarrassed. Show us the Father. How is the Father revealed? Three ways. The Father is revealed through Jesus' own words and works. We're going to see that in the next, from verses 9 through 11. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believeth me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. In other words, his words and his works are one of the, the ways. Now, the next way is to be revealed through you and I. Interesting, that's verses 12 through 15. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall, be, shall he do, because I go unto my Father. See, by him leaving the earth, he no longer is limited to locality. The Holy Spirit can be everywhere in every one of us. And that's the exchange that, in effect, is eminent here. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And then the, other, the Father is also revealed through the indwelling Spirit, and that's going to be the verses 16 to 21. I'm, I'm not trying to make a big detailed study of this, except give you a sensitivity that this is a, is, it's a highly organized path that we're on here. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. There are two Greek words for another. Uh, when, if I say to you, give me another pencil, you don't know if I mean just like the one I just broke, or if I want a pencil of a different color or a different kind. In the English, you just, I just want another. In the Greek, there's two words. There is um, alos and heteron. Alos is one of the same kind, heteron is one of a different kind. So you give me another sandwich. I don't want peanut butter on tuna or something. You find, that's another of a different kind, okay? And when uh, Stephen in Acts 7 says, another Pharaoh arose who knew not Joseph, that was someone not a non-Egyptian Pharaoh. We know from Isaiah he was an Assyrian. Um, here, though, the word another is the, is the, is the opposite, is alan, which means another comforter of the same kind. Now, there's also another member of the Trinity, in effect. He shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you for how long? Forever. It's a long time. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And around here is, around this, there's a whole study you can make and the difference between having the Holy Spirit with you and the Holy Spirit 
in you. And that's a, that's a big, big difference, and that will come to a climax in, the, in, the, in the, the feast that we just celebrated a couple of days ago, the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, which is at the, the, feast, the uh, feast of First Fruits, when Jesus um, rose from the dead, was on the Feast of First Fruits. It's the morning after Shabbat, after Passover. Passover is any day of the week, but that following that, there's a Shabbat or a Saturday. The next morning, which is obviously a Sunday, is the feast of, week, a feast of first fruits. And he was, of course, our first fruits. What they do then, they count 49 days plus one after that, and that brings you to Shavuot, which we would have celebrated if we were on our toes <laughs> this last Sunday, or actually Saturday night and Sunday. And uh, that's when the Spirit was given in a very, very unique way in Acts chapter 2 and following. Let's see, so, for he dwelleth with you, and he shall be in you. Something very distinctive. And I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, and ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Wow. What on earth does that mean? I encourage you to pray that one through, think through it very carefully, because I, I believe he means what he says and says what he means. He continues, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I wish will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Those are incredible promises. Judas, a different Judas, not Iscariot. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? This is the guy sometimes called Thaddeus Labius. He's, a, he's one of the other disciples. The Judas was not an unusual name. Um, how is it thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me, excuse me, he that loveth me not, Keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So we had four questions now. Remember, we had three of them already. Here's the fourth one. How can you manifest yourself to us and not to the world? These are the four burning questions that chapter 14 is hitting head on. Where are you going? How can we know the way? Show us the Father. How can you manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Three ways. By fellowship. We'll see that in verse 23. By the indwelling spirit, and there's another one we're coming. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you most things. No, that's not what your Bible says, right? Good for you, Tracy. <laughs> She's keeping me honest here. I was baiting her anyway. He shall teach you all things. And bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, and my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Comforting words. So we have by fellowship, by the indwelling spirit, and by inner peace. Judicial versus experiential peace. Not the peace like some people talk about. Reconciliation in, in, in lieu of alienation. Tranquility versus tumult. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice. Because I said, I go unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. He fully understands that what he's saying to them is far beyond their ability to grasp it at this time. But what they will do is it all starts to unfold. That they, re, they will recall what he said and it will all start to fit together. And that's also true of us. We can, the whole gospel of John is like that. They say it's, it's shallow enough for a child to wade in and it's deep enough for an elephant to bathe in. Every time you go through the gospel of John, you can, take, you can slice another layer. First time you go through, it's a comfortable gospel because you can understand it and it's exciting and it hits, it hits head on. The reality of who Jesus Christ really is. Matthew, what he said. Mark, what he did. Luke, his humanity, what he felt. John, who he was. 
But as you go, every time you go through the Gospel of John, if it's be it a hundred times, you'll make new discoveries, and you begin to realize it's highly organized. It's just as heptatically structured, sevenfold structured as Revelation, except it's not as obvious. Revelation seven, 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 seven. So is the Gospel of John, except it's more subtle. And uh, uh, anyway, it's a it's a it's a very very fascinating book, not to study again and again. As you mature, you will discover it always meets you wherever you're at. That's a kind of exciting. So the same things here with the disciples. What he's saying is pretty straightforward, yet they obviously couldn't grasp the, the, the least of it until the events start unfolding. He goes on, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. The enmity of the serpent is being readied to vent on the seed of the woman. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I, uh, do I you. Arise, let us go hence. This apparently is where they got up and started to walk to Gethsemane. But we're going to go through several chapters here, and the, the scholars are a little divided as how much of those chapters are still here before they actually leave, or how much of this is en route, and how much of this might be in the garden. So that's something you can come to your own. But clearly this is a point at which they're uh, getting ready to go. And uh, the, uh, the word is, let us go. It's very similar to the term that you give to armies getting ready for battle. And uh, we don't have no idea if they lingered or if they went to an intermediate pa- place. We don't know. Uh, at midnight, the temple would have been open, so they might have gone into the temple for a bit. Who knows? Um, so, uh, but when you get to John 18, verse 1, or, you know, then it's, they're going to cross over the brook into the garden. So between here, we've got 15, 16, and 17, very key chapters. There are some place between the supper and actually entering the garden. Where they are is, is a point of conjecture. John 15, this is the famous chapter for vine and branches and so forth, familiar to many people. I am the true vine, he continues, I, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So this is, by the way, if you've been studying the Gospel of John, the seventh I am statement. Jesus makes all these I am statements. I am the vine and so forth. Well, uh, he, here he is, uh, is, one, is the seventh of these statements. And uh, so, and he's the true vine, implying that there are vines that are not true vines. And taketh away. Now, what on earth does this mean? He's going to t- those that don't bear fruit are going to be taken away. Does that mean you lose your salvation? Many people are concerned about that sort of thing. What do you mean? What does he mean by taking away here? There's a number of views. Some people say, well, what he's talking about is a true believer apostatizing. Some people try to d- defend that view. Um, the Arminians feel that a Christian who does not abide in Christ loses salvation. That's what the that's the main distinctive of people who would identify themselves as Armin- uh, uh, Arminians. And uh, this seems to be refuted by John 4.14, 1028, a handful of others, especially chapter 1028 uh, and other places. The other extreme is the eternal security position. That uh, if that's the case, the people who were taken away must be a mere professor, not really united to Christ. But he said they were branches and they were in him. The, the, the Armenians and the Calvinists are both true in what they assert, but they're both wrong in what they deny. And so, uh, want to be, watch that one. But see, they were branches, they were me. Otherwise, it could be fruit bearing. They're taking away in the sense of fruit bearing, not salvation is the issue here. The word arii, which is to take away, is the root from, is the root from which we get the term resurrection. It means to take up or lift up. Taketh away is, one, is to be lifted up. And this becomes clear when you understand how the fruit bearing really took place. The, vi- the vine dresser doesn't necessarily cut away a vine unless it's dead. He gently lifts it up to the sun so it has an opportunity to bear fruit. That's what lifting it up is. And it's not judgment but encouragement that's referenced here in the minds of many. And this is sim- similar to Daniel seven fourteen and elsewhere. So there's different views by different people. I wouldn't build a doctrine in any one of them. I would fit it into what you know from the rest of the, se- the text. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. That's the real point here, is that abiding cannot come without obedience. 
I am the vine and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. The branches can't bear fruit without being connected to the vine. The, vine, the branches don't, they bear the fruit. They don't strain to make it. They do it because they're connected to the vine. That's the flavor here. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. And herein is my Father glorified that ye may bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. One of the questions I usually ask an audience is how many in the room here are in the full-time ministry? And I usually get maybe 10% of the hands up. Then I usually ask, okay, how many of you are saved by the blood of Christ? No, all the hands go up. You know. Okay, then how many of you are in the full-time ministry whether you know it or not? See, we all are. That's what he, he, he that's what, if you're saved, the qu next question is, what have you done with it? What fruit have you borne? Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples, by bearing fruit for him. Now, there's going to be an interesting event occur when, when, when uh, Peter denies Christ and realizes he has three times before the cock crows, and he, he goes out and weeps bitterly. Resurrection morning, they're instructed, go tell my disciples and Peter. See, his salvation was not in jeopardy. His discipleship was. There's a difference. I'll leave you with that for now. Okay. Loss of salvation. The presumption. Again, the same line up here. Profession without salvation. I think the believer losing his reward. Premature death of the non-abider. Stripped of gifts. Not a salvation. You didn't contribute anything to that. Jesus did it all. No, no. But it's a question of rewards, gifts. Good example, Ananias and Sapphira were taken out of the ball game. Does that mean they were unsaved? No. But they're certainly taken, they were, they're, they're, their ministry certainly was ended. Sin at the Lord's table, Paul deals with that in 1 Corinthians 11, same kind of thing. There is a sin unto death, 1 John 5. So these are views. Understand the distinction between rewards and salvation. You can't earn your salvation. To try to add to that, to try to earn it is... Is a form of blasphemy. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken to you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Obedience is always the love response. And uh, we could go on and on with that, but I think it's pretty straightforward. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You know, I love that verse. It may surprise you to realize that that's the verse that underwrites the patriot soldier as the most noble profession. Those that are really committed to being a professional soldier. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Big if there. If ye are my friends. You know, it's interesting to understand how God uses that term friendship. Abraham was known as the friend of God, so-called 2 Chronicles 7 and some other places. Isaiah 41 and also the book of James. In Genesis 18, Abraham, uh, God says, is he not my friend? Should I not tell him what I'm about to do? You'll see an association in Genesis 18 in God's mind with being a friend and confiding in him what's about to happen. And he recounts to him what's going to happen in Sodom and Gomorrah in the next chapter, chapter 19. And you may recall that very colorful scene where Abraham negotiates with God. What if there's 50 righteous in the city and so forth? But uh, so it's interesting that here the disciples... In, in verse 15, he says, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I've called you my friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. In other words, friendship is associated with being on the inside. Because he's, they're no longer his servants, they're now his friends, he's going to tell them what's, he's telling them what's going to happen. You can take that to the extreme, strangely enough. There's one prophet uh, in the Old Testament that was known as the beloved prophet. Prophet. Who was the beloved prophet? 
Daniel, exactly. Daniel, thou art uh, greatly beloved. And Daniel is the apocalyptic, uh, uh, comprehensive uh, prophet of the Old Testament. In the New Testament, one of the disciples is known as the one that Jesus, who was the most beloved, which was the beloved disciple? Who wrote the apocalyptic book of the New Testament? John. You see the linkage I'm, I'm suggesting? I'm, it's, it's, just a, it's just something that, uh, uh, it's just an observation. It's not some doctrine. It's just an observation. I think it's interesting that um, the, uh, the intimacy is a function of, uh, uh, can be measured by the, the degree to which he's disclosing what's going to happen. And that's exactly what he's saying in verse 15. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father have I made, have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Did the world hate Christ? If you're in Christ, do you expect the world to love you? You know, we say that so glibly, and yet we're always shook when we begin to see it in action. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. <laughs> Did they keep a saying? No. Will they keep yours? No. Okay. But all these things they will do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they had, had not sinned. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now they have both seen and hated both me and my father. In the sense of clarifying it, basically, is the flavor there. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Wow. This is the written word in the Old Testament that testifies against Israel. It's not the New Testament. It's the Old Testament. Their own word. The, the, the word of God testifies against them. But when the Comforter has come whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he will testify of whom? Jesus, always. It's astonishing how many people who study the Holy Spirit fail to really countenance the fact that he always testifies of Jesus Christ. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. So now we get into John 16, find out what we're going to expect here. These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. This is now he's going to show the fulfillment of the, pre the verses we just read last chapter. Here's how it's going to be fulfilled. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God a service. Boy, isn't that a summary of religious history need to realize that Jesus Christ is the most anti-religious person that ever walked the face of the earth. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you a truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Boy, this is a key study here. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin... Because they believe not on me. That's the ultimate sin. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and, and ye see me no more. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judge. So here we're talking about objective condemnation, not subjective realization here. And uh, 
We could spend the whole hour on those three issues, but let's move on. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the, this is a key verse, very, verse 13 here, 16, 13, remember it. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. He, and, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. You know, it's fascinating. It says, for he shall not speak of himself. It's interesting that the Holy Spirit never testifies of himself. And let me give you the extremes of that. In Genesis 24, we have Abraham uh, sending his servant to get a bride for Isaac. It's very analogous, in a sense, to Genesis, uh, to Genesis 22, Abraham's offering of Isaac. Abraham in the role of the father, Isaac the role of the son. In two chapters later, in chapter 24, again, we have Abraham the role of the father, and he's calling his eldest servant to get a bride for Isaac. And he obviously is doing what? He's going he's to go to, to, to the family of Laban, qualify her by a well, offer her gifts. She's going to agree to marry someone she's never met um, and bring her to be the bride of Isaac. So he is, th th this eldest servant is in the role of what? The comfort of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that he, you, he doesn't use his name. He's an unnamed servant. You can figure out his name by going back to Genesis 15 because his eldest servant's name was Eliezer, which means comforter, by the way. When you get to the book of Ruth, there again we have a, a, a type being set up. Boaz is the kinsman redeemer. And Naomi is Israel, out of the land but coming back, being redeemed by the act of Boaz, who, who does all this by taking a Gentile bride, Ruth. And that whole love story, little four-chapter book of Ruth is so fascinating. But it's interesting, how does Ruth, the Gentile bride, get introduced to Boaz? The answer in, verse, in chapter 2 is through an unnamed servant. It's, whenever you see in the typology, the unnamed servant, the, the Holy Spirit is always unnamed servant. And uh, because of John 16, 13, he shall not speak of himself. And it's interesting. I think it, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it, these are... Subtleties, but very real things. He shall glorify me, he shall receive of mine, and he shall show it to you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore I said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. And then said some of the disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see, ye shall see me. And because I go to the Father. See, the disciples, hearing all this, are obviously baffled, confused. They said, therefore, what is this that he saith a little while? We cannot tell what he said. Now Jesus knew what they were desirous to ask him and said unto them, do ye inquire among yourselves of what I said a little while and shall not see me? And again, a little while and ye shall see me? Verily, verily, I say unto you ye, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned unto joy. A woman, when she is in travel, hath sorrow, because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for the joy that a man is born in the world. That's an, the analogy he's drawing here. And ye now, therefore, have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full." These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. In that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say it not unto you, that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and am a, and come into the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. This Hosea 5.15, he's returning to his place until they acknowledge their offense, meaning Israel, of course. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverbs. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee by this? We believe that thou camest forth from God. And Jesus answered them, Do ye, do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, now is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Boy, do we need to cling to that, need to cling to that one. 
Now we're heading where I've been hoping to go, and that is John 17. Some people would call this the Holy of Holies of the New Testament. Many of us use the term the Lord's Prayer for what really should be called the Disciples' Prayer. The prayer that Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount is a prayer that he can't pray. It's the one he taught us is how to pray. This is really the chapter that should be called the Lord's Prayer. We're going to be treated here. We're going to go in inside the veil and hear him preach or to uh, pray to the Father. And the importance of prayer. We see it. He prayed intensely at his baptism, at the commencement of his ministry, at the eve of the, uh, selecting disciples, all through the gospel. Every time there's something important, you find Jesus not only prayed many times all night long at the transfiguration. And uh, so this prayer is important. We're going to enter into the, one of the simplest passages in the New Testament, and yet, uh, I should say simple language, and yet one of the most profound in meaning in the entire New Testament as we go forward here. He also prayed as he ceased to breathe. Our most important work, yours and mine, is prayer. It's more important than anything else we do. And it's, it's so, it seems so simple that we overlook it. We certainly overlook its importance. Let's take a look at what he did. Uh, we're going to find in here all the factors of the redemption, the salvation, manifestation, the representation, sanctification, edification. All the factors are here. You can just outline them and study it at your leisure. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son, that thy son may also glorify thee. As thou, he's speaking, now this is, the, this is Jesus speaking to the Father. And thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. That's interesting. As many as has been given him. If you have eternal life, it's because the Father gave you to the Son. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. There's going to be seven specific requests. Glorification of the Son, the restoration of his original glory, the protection of his disciples, and that includes future believers like you and me. Sanctification, pray for sanctification, unification, and glorification, and that the world might know all this. He's going to have a status report. The filial relationship with God, the appointed time has now arrived. He has had authority over all flesh that was given, bestowal of eternal life on the elect as promised. This is like a progress report to the Father. He would be bringing them to a knowledge of the Father. He had glorified the Father on earth. These are his, this is his progress report. Most of us you know, think of a progress report a little differently. A progress report is a report in lieu thereof. But this is a little different. This is what he really did. He had finished the work. He had finished the work given him to do. Let's see what he says. He's speaking to the Father. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. What an awesome thing for the Son to be able to report to his Father. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. And they have kept thy word. Boy, I hope that can be said of us. Man. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. One of my favorite exam questions is, name something God loves that he didn't pray for. What did God love that he didn't pray for? We know he's loved the world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and so forth, right? John 3, 16. But uh, 17, 9, John 17, 9 says, he prays not for the world. There's a distinction. That's interesting. All mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Holy Father, how interesting. In a few hours, he's, he's not going to be able to use that phrase. He's going to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why? Because he's in our shoes. He's alienated from the Father there. He's not here. 
In fact, before he's alienated, he takes the responsibility that he's had, that he's discharged faithfully, and who does he give it to? His father. Holy Father, you, Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. Our security rests with whom right now? God himself. God the Father himself. That they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. But, of course, the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. How many did Jesus Christ lose? None. When we get before that throne and the whole story is in front of us, will Jesus be able to say the same thing? I don't believe it's possible for any that are his to be lost. They can fumble, they can lose rewards, but that's what eternal life means. He paid for it, he did it, the responsibility was his, he gave it to the Father, and I think the Father is faithful. Heavy stuff. Have yourself. When you start going down these doctrinal paths, Arminian or Calvinist, both of those extremes, you're playing with fire. Because you can very inadvertently, obviously, impugn the character of God. Be careful. And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word. The world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So we have a different standing. We're in Christ, not Adam. We have a different nature. We're born of the Spirit, not of flesh. We have a different master, not the God of this world. And we have a different aim, to glorify God, not ourselves. That's the long and the short of it. Then he says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We live in a culture which says there is no truth. Unknowingly attacking God himself. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now who's that? That's us. That's the extension of all of this to us. It's not just a, a, an unbridled inference. It's there explicitly. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Wow, we have no capacity to imagine what that means that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, that the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. And that's the crux of the entire universe that's going to be measured by its relationship to Jesus Christ. Because that's the way God set it up. He, he makes the rules. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. Praise God. That they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, into the which he entered and his disciples. And that's where we'll be heading in the next session. Same as, the same as is in John 7. The believer has the same life as Christ, according to verse 2. He has the same security as Christ in verse 11. He has the same separation as Christ in verse 14. He has the same sending into the world as Christ in verse 18. He has the same union as Christ in verse 21, the same glory as Christ in verse 22, and the same love as Christ in verse 23. Man, that's a pl plateful. Do you think those disciples understood what they were hearing? I don't think so. Any more that I think we understand it, having heard it. But I do invite us to retrace these steps and to appropriate John 17 into our own hearts by study, prayerful study ourselves. In the next session, we're going to talk about the night of nights. Talk about Gethsemane, and we'll take, see how it snapshots in each of the four Gospels, and we'll go through the Jewish trials. 
There'll be six trials, three Jewish trials at night, and then three Roman trials in the morning. Six trials. For Annas, before Caiaphas, and before the Sanhedrin, that'll all occur before sunrise. And then the Roman trials before Pilate, he'll try to pass it off and hear it. That won't work. So it's back for it before Pilate, and, and you know what happens in the afternoon. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.